In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Can you move it? Yeah. So these three months, I figured out, are the longest time I've gone without preaching since 2005. So I hope I remember how. And of course, this is the first time in 18 months that I've been inside here at this pulpit with more than a handful of you in the congregation. I'm a little verklempt. <laughs> it's another new experience and a milestone. So let's start with just a moment of silence to acknowledge and bless and give thanks for the one who has kept us alive and sustained us and brought us to this moment. Amen. Where do I start? I have so much to tell you. So many layers I've been living in. So many boons to bring back as we enter this new season, this third trimester of our nine-month pilgrimage. I went a few times this summer to St. Cyprian's, the Episcopal church that's closest to our home in Hampton. And the last time, the guest preacher, a friend of Ron Ramsey's from Detroit, preached for 45 minutes. So I thought, maybe, but no. <laughs> As I said in the cloak, it's going to take me all of Martin Tide to unpack the unfolding lessons of this time. So I'm certainly not going to try to cram it all into one sermon. And... My most fervent prayer, as I emerge from this time away, as we all reconnect and share stories and decipher the next chapter in our book of transformations, is that we all do that in a way that honors and embodies what we've been learning, that honors, in fact, the spirit of St. Martin. As Rumi says, let the beauty you love be what you do. And so that small silence that I started with is a nod to the, some of the beauty that I've been relearning to love this summer. Not only literal silence, though that is wonderful, but also the quieting down of stimulation of all kinds, inner and outer. That constant buzz that keeps us hurrying and overfunctioning and multitasking. In the cloak, I shared a picture of two dragonflies who alighted on my pen while I was sitting reading on the beach. And when I was looking back through my journal, I discovered that I had written about another one that I saw from our front porch, sitting on a flower very still while everything went on around him, cars driving by, a lawnmower next door, and he flew away and then he returned. The contemplative life I've been realizing isn't just about making time in a busy day for a period of quiet meditation, soul nourishing as that is. It's a way of being and seeing and hearing all the time, becoming human again, slowing down to the pace of our planet and the animals and plants who share it, opening our hearts to the spirit's whisper in the web of life. 
I learned this by doing it, hanging out with the dragonflies and mockingbirds and sand crabs and Brendan, our Wheaton Terrier. I learned it walking on the beach and the dunes and watching the tide come in and go out, seeing sunsets and storms and planets and stars and rainbows. And I learned it by reading an amazing novel last month, The Overstory, by Richard Powers, that I then smiled to see Bishop Curry quote from In Love is the Way. You have to read it. But meanwhile, there's here are a few lines from the beginning that capture its message, the beauty that I love and want to do. A woman sits on the ground, leaning against a pine. Its bark presses hard against her back, as hard as life. Its needles scent the air, and a force hums in the heart of the wood. Her ears tune down to the lowest frequencies. The tree is saying things in words before words. It says, sun and water are questions endlessly worth answering. And later, your kind never sees us whole. You miss the half of it and more. There's always as much below ground as above. That's the trouble with people, their root problem. Life runs alongside them, unseen. Listen, there's something you need to hear. So after I finished the book, for the last 10 days before I returned to the office this past Wednesday, I reread all of the wonderful letters to Lisa that had carried me through the summer. And our sabbatical companions, Jim and Doug, had written theirs on two sheets of stationery from the County Hotel Canterbury that Jim had incredibly saved from our choir tour in 1981. <laughs> he had said that we would be refreshing and improving our frequently invisible spirits not as iron sharpens iron, but as sunlight, air, and water reach and encourage developing understory plants on the forest floor. Couldn't believe it. The understory. That's the quiet, slow, patient, gentle way of listening and trusting the force that hums in the heart of the wood. It's Martin's way. And it starts with, what's, with listening to what's humming in our own hearts. As Rowan Williams writes in Where God Happens, if I don't know how to attend to the reality that is my own inner turmoil, I shall fail in responding to the needs of someone else. And that finally brings me to the gospel story we just heard, which I recall is something that sermons are supposed to do. Isn't it surprising that this story even made the cut in not one but two Gospels? It does not portray Jesus in a flattering light. And in several sermons over the years, I've reframed his response as pointed teasing, a teaching moment for the disciples who appear in Matthew's version of the story. But now, I'm seeing Mark's version differently. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. I get it. He's been busy casting out demons, healing Jairus' daughter and the woman with a hemorrhage, getting rejected in Nazareth, walking on water, feeding the 5,000, sending out the 12. When he welcomes them back, he tells them, Come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. But many saw them going and knew them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. Thank you for not doing that. <laughs> so maybe even Jesus needed a sabbatical. 
needed some time to attend to the reality that was his own inner turmoil, as Rowan Williams says, at the level of feelings. Without that, even he wasn't immediately responsive to the needs of someone else. Luckily, this determined woman turned the tables on his metaphor and gave him another chance. And this time he heard her. Since Mark is fond of saying immediately, I think it happened twice in the gospel, I like to think that since he doesn't say it after this, that Jesus got at least a little rest before heading back to Galilee and yet another person in need of healing. And I wonder if when he looked up to heaven after the stuff with the spit and the touching the tongue, he looked up to heaven and sighed and said, Ephata, be open. I wonder if he wasn't just talking to the man's ears and tongue, but also talking to his own heart and spirit. Maybe he was touching there with the one he called Father, the source of all So maybe that's one of the things that we can practice together in this season. Asking God to open us to the wisdom of our patron saint and our founders as we look toward the future. More about that in coming weeks. You can imagine that I brought like boxes of books to the beach. And in fact, at the last minute, I narrowed it down to fewer than 30 because I figured I probably wasn't going to be able to read five a week. <laughs> but some of them were devotionals, books, collection of prayers um, for morning and evening prayer that I had accumulated over the years and never really put into practice in a regular way. So that was one of the huge blessings of this time was just that rhythm. And so I want to share one with you in closing. This is one of the morning prayers for Wednesdays from an Iona prayer book by Peter Miller. And Wednesdays in that book have the theme of pilgrimage. The peace of God, the peace of Patrick, calmly, the peace of Bridget, the beloved, the peace of Martin, the gentle, walk with you this day and always. Amen. <laughs>